uh, Mendel Kalin is with us today. He's um, a uh, neuroscientist by training. He studied in Groningen, as he told me, and then moved over to London and did his PhD and his postdoc time in a total of eight years until 2018 at Imperial College in London. And uh, that under the supervision of David Nutt and uh, Robin Card Harris, um, all both are names that if you haven't heard them already, you should definitely check out alongside Mendel himself. His work uh, is really truly impactful on, on everything that MIND is also interested in and um, that MIND is also uh, doing at the moment. And, um, but since 18, 2018, Mendel has uh, shifted his focus fully on the project of wave paths, with, which he's gonna talk about um, today to us. And um, yeah, this is something that, that he is building um, with full focus. So uh, I'm not gonna even try to, to uh, explain that in a short moment because um, that's, that's his thing. Um, so yeah, um, before we start, I just wanna uh, take a, a little bit of time to explain the agenda. So Mendel has prepared a 30 minute talk for us. And after that he has offered, and I think that's, that's actually really amazing. He's offered for all of us to try the wave paths um, experience itself. So we're gonna um, be offered a deep listening experience. And what that means is we're gonna close down the Zoom call after having received the instructions from Mendel and we all receive a link um, and then we switch over to a different browser. And I believe it's smart to use Chrome, right? But it really, it doesn't matter, but yeah. It doesn't really matter, yeah. Okay, so I can okay. explain the, uh, the, the technical details at the end as well, just to remind people. Okay, perfect, yeah. perfect. Um, and then uh, we have a, about a 30 minute experience, I think all, everyone individually, and then we're gonna come back to the call and then we're gonna do the conversation of the Q&A. And please feel free to submit questions during the talk, during the experience. Uh, it's probably um, not really feasible because the experience is, is a full focus thing. But if there is something that comes up, uh, feel free to, to shoot a question into Slido. And yeah, then we have actually uh, almost an hour, I think of Q&A, depending on, on how many questions there are. And that's, that's it for now. And now it's 10 past six and I would love to now hand it over to Mendel. Thank you so much, Alessandro. And hello, my past neighbors as a Dutch person. Um, grew up in Drenthe, the Northeast and moved to Groningen when I was 18 and studied there initially biology, marine biology and um, pivoted to neuroscience very soon, really out of an interest in consciousness and then after that, um, my interest in psychedelics started to grow and grow. In 2011, I moved to London, and that's where really my, um, my research career began in psychedelics and psychedelics and music. And what I was thinking of, and, and thank you first for Alessandro, Alejandra, and Max for uh, not only inviting me, but also giving me two hours uh, to, to, to connect with you all. Um, thinking about what most likely would be the best use of this time is rather than me talking for two hours, which I can easily do if I'm not careful, um, I like to time box myself for 30 minutes and give a bird eye overview of the current research on music and psychedelics and what WavePaths, my organization, is currently doing and developing. And then rather than only talking about music, Let's listen to music. Let's, let's, let's all have an experience of the music together, uh, which could also be a nice break after all the information that has been shared. And then exactly, I think we have about an hour then for um, conversation. And there are many different things we can explore there. The, the topic of music of psychedelics is huge and it's also very early days. Um, I'm, like Max was explaining to me before we had this meeting, often cited in um, music protocols of psychedelic therapies, um, my research at Imperial at least. Um, but it's also because there's very little research being done at this moment. And this, is, this has for me personally been one of my main motivations to leave Imperial, not because I had a bad time. In, in fact, it was the opposite. I had a really inspiring time with um, my colleagues there, but I really felt a great 
motivation to double down my focus on the topic that I'm most um, enthusiastic about, which is music and psychedelic therapy. And that is what WavePaths is doing in essence. We're researching and developing the therapeutic functions of music in psychedelic therapy, but also beyond psychedelic therapy. The more I do this research, the more I become convinced that there are therapeutic potentials in music itself that are really under leveraged right now in our society. And that music itself can be a psychedelic in that real meaning of the word psychedelic, soul revealing, that music can be a similar, not the same, but a similar psychedelic agent that can be worked with therapeutically as well. Um, but yeah, thanks again for inviting me and I'm gonna share my screen and start my presentation. Let's see, share screen and there we have it. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, good. Okay. I am gonna keep this initial introduction very short because most of us are familiar with the main findings here and the main motivations why psychedelic therapy is such an important modality to study and take seriously is because mental health care as we know it is really walking what I sometimes call a dead end road. It's a paradigm that is stuck in a, in a particular set of limitations. And this is very evident when we look at the statistics at the number of people that are suffering and the number of people that seek help for their suffering but actually are not helped. 33%, one third of all patients with depression, for example, do not respond to any therapy currently available. There is a huge amount of unresolved suffering and a massive economical burden that our society is, is uh, carrying as well. So for really good reasons, psychiatrists and mental health care providers all over the world are gradually taking psychedelic therapy more seriously because of the results that are coming out of these studies are so uh, profoundly um, um, effective, but also very interesting. Um, one of the uh, things I always like to emphasize is that you look at these graphs, we not only see an acute remission in symptoms, but you also see that they sustain over periods of time only after one or two sessions. Um, we should never simplify this. We should never think that we can heal people with one or two sessions as a rule of thumb. Um, I think inter interpreting these studies um, um, really need to be done with a lot of nuance, but this is unprecedented. When we compare this with other mental health care opportunities out there, this is completely unprecedented. And rightly so, we are seeing more and more research being lifted from the ground, including in Germany. Congratulations again, it's really fantastic to, to heard that news. I believe it was a few months ago that I heard that. Um, so that is interesting, not only acute effects, but sustained effects. And um, when we look at the mediating variables underlying this, this is one of the consensuses that you see in literature is that these, these sustained therapeutic outcomes are mediated by certain qualities in the experiences. So psychedelic medicines can facilitate a wide range of experiences, a very wide range of experiences when you think of it, psychologically, subjectively, emotionally, physically. Um, I would sometimes even argue that any kind of, any, everything on the spectrum of the human experience is possible to experience under a psychedelic. Because at the end of the day, what these compounds are doing are um, intensifying, enhancing, catalyzing certain processes that are already there inside of ourselves. But there are certain experiences that are correlated with positive therapy outcomes. Some studies report that 86.7%, let's call it 87%, rated their psilocybin experiences amongst the five most personally meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their lives. I don't know, there's many different studies now that show something similar. And how I sometimes like to phrase this is by shifting away the focus on peak experiences or mystical type experiences, which these studies show correlated positive therapy outcomes and, 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 and argue for an umbrella term. When we look at all of these experiences, what they have in common in essence are that they are personally significant. So I'm gonna to offer to you in this slide in the coming few slides is a framework to understand how psychedelic therapy is such a different paradigm from other mental health care therapies out there and why this is significant. 
So when we look at these studies, we see that the occurrence of peak experiences or mystical type experiences correlated positive therapy outcomes. So one of the arguments I'll make today is that in essence, we are talking about personally, personally significant experiences. And then one way to look at this is by, um, by arguing that the more personally significant that experience is, the more impactful that experience will be on one's identity. And the reason why I, I like to open this, um, this presentation with this argument is because the title of this presentation is Experience as Medicine. Um, the more I looked into this phenomenon of experiences as an important foundation, not the only foundation, but a very important foundation for the sustained changes, the more I realized that actually there's nothing mysterious going on here, that this phenomena has very solid roots in how we currently understand human development from a neuroscientific perspective. Really briefly, when we think about learning and how learning happens, there are these two distinct learning systems that we have identified. One is concerned with explicit learning, recalling explicit um, memories, um, things like recalling semantic knowledge or symbolic knowledge or episodic memories, events from the past. This is explicit learning. The other system is an implicit learning system. And an implicit learning system literally means learning by experiencing. Implicit learning drives subconscious memory formations that have a huge impact on how we perceive ourselves and how we behave. And implicit learning includes things like procedural learning, conditioning, and priming. Um, in other words, um, we can only learn how to ride a bicycle by riding a bicycle. We can only learn how to walk by walking, falling, walking, falling, trial and error, eventually fine tuning our motor system by act actively doing it, by actively engaging these systems. And the same applies to other um, phenomena. The way we relate to ourselves, the way we perceive the world is driven and influenced a lot by implicit learning mechanisms. Another finding here is that the more emotionally salient an experience is, the more impactful that experience is. The emotional system of the brain is one of the strongest learning systems that we are equipped with and it's fully implicit. And therefore, one framework that I'd like to offer to you to look at psychedelic therapy is by, by, by viewing psychedelic therapy as a climate in which you as a therapist want to provide these implicit learning experiences to your patients. In the same way that we can only learn how to ride a bicycle by riding a bicycle, we can only hope by hoping. We can only learn to love ourselves by feeling the love for ourselves, feeling that compassion for ourselves. We can only learn and th that we are worth to be loved by others by experiencing that directly as well. Um, so there's much more to say about this, but for the sake of the, the conversation, I'm going to accelerate a little bit and bring in the, the topic of music within this framework that I just provided. So first of all, we like to acknowledge that psychedelic therapy is not pharmacotherapy. We're not giving drugs and expecting people to be better. It's also not psychotherapy in the way that we are used to think about psychotherapy. Usually psychotherapy sessions don't last for five to 10 hours. And usually they're not limited to, an, to only a small number of sessions. And usually people don't experience these profound experiences within the first session immediately. Um, it, psychedelic therapy seems to represent a new paradigm of mental health care, a new way of understanding, of conceptualizing, of defining what mental health actually means and how we can offer care to those who seek this. And therefore, in the wake of this huge interest that is exploding all around the world in psychedelic therapy, there are some, some really key questions and challenges for this emerging field to address. How can we facilitate those therapeutically significant implicit learning experiences? How can we guide these people through those altered states of consciousness in a safe way, an effective way, in an ethical way, given that most, if not all, psychotherapists and psychologists are not necessarily trained to guide people through radical altered states of consciousness? This is a very interesting question. 
Um, when we look at the, the, the way cyclic therapy is currently being performed and developed, it is a continuation of, first of all, to acknowledge this, of how it was developed in the, 50, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s in Europe, the United States, and other countries. Um, and those researchers already recognize that cyclic therapy is no magic pill, that there are, there are all these non-drug variables that have a huge influence in the experience. And because the experience is where the change happens, designing those non-drug variables is a very important component of the therapy, a very important element of the therapy itself. Sometimes I say that psychedelic therapy, another way to conceptualize psychedelic therapy is designing or providing a favorable climate in which the client can discover or rediscover and experience new or for forgotten or more adaptive concepts of oneself. And I refer to this, these non-drug variables as together with the medicine itself, as the synergistic core. There are these, very, these different variables, but they work in synergy with each other, they interact with each other to together provide this therapeutic experience for the client. We have the medicine, we have the room itself, we have music, which is often a very central component in the therapy, and we have the interpersonal um, bubble, the, the, in, the interpersonal cocoon, the, the therapeutic relationship between patient and therapist in which this experience takes place. So when I started my PhD at Imperial in 2012, I was not intending to actually study music. Um, and um, I, I, I was primarily tasked to do a neuroimaging study on the acute effects of LSD. Um, music has always been a personal passion of mine. In fact, I quit it, all work and studies in 2007 because I felt I was on a fork on the road in my personal life where, where I needed to make a decision. Do I become a, an artist, a musician, or do I become a psychedelic therapy researcher? And I decided to choose the latter. And only much later, I realized that I can harmonize those two interests. And my argument to study psychedelic music really came forth from this realization that music is almost the almost as common in, in therapy as a chair to sit on. Almost all psychedelic therapists are using music in the practice. And therefore, in order to understand some of these um, elements in this very new paradigm, we need to understand the role of music. We need to understand how psychedelic music work in the brain, but maybe even more importantly, how music is experienced and what the variables in music we can understand better in order to facilitate therapy in a person-centered, client-centered way to support the patient better and to, um, and to facilitate positive therapy outcomes. Um, so I'm gonna give you a kind of a two minute summary of my research over the last eight years. And then we can use this as a foundation for further conversation as well. So, um, one second, just going to minimize this. So, first of all, one of the most um, one one of the one of the one of the findings we published on a number of times is that under the influence of a psychedelic drug, the emotions usually experienced to music, comparing psychedelics with placebo in these cases is significantly intensified. So the music evoked emotions are enhanced. Um, this is a study by Catherine Preller that dem who demonstrated that the perceived meaning in music is enhanced under a psychedelic. We are starting to understand some of the um, brain mechanisms underlying um, the processing of the different elements of the music. So when we talk about music, we're in essence talking about structured sound, uh, a sound that is stru structured according to frequencies, according to rhythms, um, according to modes and key changes and um, different tone color changes. And the brain is processing all these different acoustic features together and creates this... Um, is emergent total experience of a musical progression. And we did some research in, 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 in looking into how the brain is processing these acoustic features differently 
a neuropsychedelic uh, compared to placebo and how this correlates with enhanced emotionality, for example. Um, one of my first studies I published, we looked at um, personal memories, autobiographical memories, um, and a bit more broadly speaking, mental imagery as well, and the vividness of these memories and imagery. And we showed that the vividness is enhanced, and we have suggested the brain mechanism underlying this, um, this phenomena as well. We're starting to um, see some predictors gradually for behavior change and remission. And if anyone of you is interested in uh, review articles, there's an article I wrote together with Frederick Baird and Catherine Preller in 2018. And um, last year, the end of last year, uh, Charles Probe, new editorial called Hallucinogens, I um, published a chapter um, on music as well. There's a number of things we can highlight here, but one of the studies I like to highlight, first of all, is the Hidden Therapist paper, because this for me was um, a major motivation to continue studying music. Um, one of the things that we discovered in this study was, I just hear someone unmuting the microphone, I think. Not anymore. Um, one of the things we discovered in this study was that there are certain qualities in the music experience that correlate with positive therapy outcomes and with certain aspects in the experience, whereas the drug intensity itself doesn't. And I'm going to unpack this statement and make it a little bit more comprehensible for you. If you look at the graph on the, the right side, um, on the x-axis, you see scores for depression, a questionnaire called the opposite states of, question, of consciousness. I'm just going to do a check-in because I heard some sounds and I've got a warning that my internet is unstable. Does everyone still hear me? I'm just going to look back at the screen. Can I get some thumbs up, thumbs down? Was the sound okay so far? There's a bit of rumbling, but it, so far for me, it doesn't lose its continuity. Interesting. Okay, good. Thanks. There's a storm going out outside. I'm in Portugal and all Wi-Fi is dependent on uh, satellites. So that may explain. Um, let me know whenever the, the sound is, uh, is being difficult. Okay, thank you. Uh, X-axis, depression after one week, uh, various elements of the experience of the psychedelic medicine, um, in this case, psilocybin. This was a study looking at um, treatment-resistant depression. Uh, patients received two psilocybin sessions. And um, we um, interviewed patients in depth about their music experience and we also implemented a range of questionnaires to, to assess the experience. And we found that the liking, the resonance and the openness to the music correlated selectively with depression. Um, if I would ever do this again, if I ever would publish a study again, I would most likely simply report one, one variable here because liking, resonance and openness correlate heavily. They're one factor. Liking of the music, um, speaks for itself. Resonance means the degree to which the music um, is um, in harmony with the internal experience of the patient, the degree to which the subjective experience conveyed by the music is um, matching the internal experience of the patient. So often patients describe, for example, a union between the music and oneself or a great sense of flow between one inner experience and the music. Openness meaning an, an openness, an acceptance of the influence of the music. Those elements in the music experience correlated with depression one week after, whereas the, the sim simple ratings for the intensity of the drug didn't. We also look at these musical variables. You see that they selectively correlate with peak experiences and autobiographical insightfulness, whereas they do not correlate with other elements in the experience. This study um, was the first to empirically validate some of the original motivations by therapists to include music, meaning music as a tool to increase the likelihood of certain experiences to happen in psychedelic therapy. Like I mentioned in the beginning, there's a wide range of different experiences one may have with these psychedelic medicines. And music is one, maybe one out of different tools that can be utilized to facilitate experiences that have therapeutic meaning, therapeutic value. Um, 
we may return to this finding later on, um, just to make it a little bit less dry. Here I printed some of the um, some quotes from the interviews that I've done with um, the twenty patients in this study. We really have for the experience, or very disruptive for the patient experience. Um, if there's one thing I like to highlight in this presentation and this meeting together is that music itself is not necessarily good. <laughs> in fact, one of the things I became really convinced of is that music can do great harm if it's not chosen wisely um, because there's such, an, such a significant influence on the acute experience. And one framework to look at this is this framework of resonance. I'm going to give you some examples of patients with so-called high personal resonance with the music and who did really well afterwards and the opposite. So when you look at these examples on the left side, you see um, experiences like um, being carried by the music, uh, music being the vehicle that moved me. Um, it felt like it all fitted the experience. The music drove the most beautiful experience of my life. I feel the music in large part drove a lot of the experience. I did feel as if I was being held by the music. The music was spot on. It was following my emotion at the time. I could see that there was great effort to put the music together in a way that it followed the experience that it was meant to be. And very strong emotional experiences, cathartic tears. So you look at the opposite, you see, and there's a number of these, um, the sense that the music was manipulative, the sense that music was playing a trick or duping or, or, or mocking the, the listener, um, giving a false sense of security, um, patients rejecting, psychologically rejecting the music, feeling resistance for the music, uh, afraid that this sort of music was the last thing I'd ever hear, um, the music didn't feel real, um, et cetera, et cetera. I learned the most from listening to those experiences really carefully. Um, and this is one illustration of how important it is to have the music being really person-centered. A significant portion of these patients would have likely, this is of course very hypothetical, done better if the therapist in the study had the capacity and the freedom to change the music, which they unfortunately uh, didn't have. So let's move to the next chapter. We have this new paradigm of mental health care that we all are co-developing um, and therefore also a new generation of therapists that is growing and therefore one of the arguments for um, um, that I'm making here is that we also need a new generation of therapeutic instruments, therapeutic tools. Like medical doctors need medical technologies to open access and heal the body, like surgeons for example, um, Psychedelic therapists need psychedelic tools, psychedelic technologies to open access and heal the soul in a safe, ethical, and effective way. And a soul, I mean, not necessarily in a metaphysical way, but I, I like to reclaim this word more and more, although I'm a scientist, really to acknowledge the depth of the experience that people have with these, with these compounds. Um, so what WavePath is committed to is really to find ways to enhance the experience of both the care provider and the care seeker. And one of the original visions here is that there are all these interesting developments in neuroscience, psychotherapy, immersive arts, computational AI that can be unified in one framework to design, develop, and fully adaptive music technology, a fully adaptive musical instrument that therapists can work with in their practice. There's many things to say about this. We can explore this more in the Q&A, but um, when we are, as a as a society developing ways to guide people through these altered states of consciousness it would be a serious mistake to look at other traditions blindly and simply copy paste music from the ceremonial context into our culture music is often those sacred songs are very um culturally um contextualized um and 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 there is a real need for us to think what instruments are appropriate for us to use um, for our culture, for our times. Um, 
not to say, I want to be very clear about this, that there's nothing to learn from traditional and ceremonial use of psychedelics. I, in fact, am really interested in, in, in all of this. I lived in the Amazon jungle about 14 years ago for quite some time, I experienced ayahuasca myself um, quite a lot, uh, and various other ceremonial uh, uses of psychedelics. But what we are seeing there, when you look at traditional use of psychedelic medicines, is that the shaman, the medicine man, has a toolkit of instruments, not necessarily always musical instruments, but a number of musical instruments and other things as well, all there to influence the, the setting and the experience of the, the person who has the journey. And we believe that there is a, a modern equivalent needed of the traditional rattle or drum of the, the shamanic traditions. And this is one of the things we are committed to build is an instrument for this new generation of therapists. Another way to look at this is that psychedelic therapy is complex and it's novel for many of us. Music is very complex as well, um, let alone the person-centered use of music, adapting music to each and every individual and each and every individual's process in the moment. But right? that idea in itself can be daunting and frightening for many therapists. We believe that we can simplify all of this um, and, and that therapists can in fact work with music in a person-centered way with the same ease that they would change the temperature in the room with a thermostat or switch the light in the room. So that's that's our our our, our aspiration. So I'm gonna in the next minutes share some highlights of things that we have been developing on this front. Um, we have developed a, a method, an approach um, for adapting music to the medicine individual and the very dynamic experience and we are integrating this approach in in our in our tools in essence this approach looks at um, how music can be tailored to different medicines so what music is different from let's say ketamine to mdma to psilocybin to dmt uh, how um, music and or sound more generally speaking can match the different um, pharmacodynamics that are present there the different dosages and so forth and so on. The individual, who is this person? Who is this person that seeks help? What language music wise does this person speak? And how can we meet this musical language with the music selection in this, in this study? How can we ensure that this person doesn't feel alienated by the music, but the opposite, that the music lit really deeply personally resonates with this patient? Um, just a few examples of, of elements that we think about when we think about adaptation to the individual, to the person. Um, and the experience itself, this is one thing that I saw as well very clearly, is that the experience is so dynamic and unpredictable that I am more or more against playlists, um, at least the, the fixed way that playlists are designed. Um, because you cannot predict. But when I designed my earlier playlist for a number of studies, the, 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 the further I progressed in the playlist, the harder I found it to actually select music because of course it becomes more and more personalized and difficult to predict what will happen down the line for this individual. Um, needless to say, there's some nuance there that we can explore. Um, a person is also influenced by the music and the openness to the music will, will um, have the individual following the music and the, the, the kind of narrative that the music is providing. Um, but the the hard cases um, which any therapist need to be um, prepared for is what happens if the music that is being played right now is disruptive to the experience of the patient, is not supportive, or maybe even the opposite. Uh, the, the, the examples that I provided a few slides back um, of where the music was really not supportive um, some of them can be potentially be uh, counter therapeutic and maybe even traumatic if the music is not changed, given the impact of the music um, has on that experience. So how can we understand the individual? How can we understand the process, the therapeutic needs of the individual and tailor music to that process? I'm going to make this a little bit more concrete for all of you, um, giving you uh, basically a few tasters of the, of the concepts that we have developed and how we're working with this. Um, three 
key concepts I'd like to highlight when we think about person-centered music. The first one is effect achievement or emotional achievement. The second one is the different types of direction the music can provide, or in other words, the different types of functions, the therapeutic functions the music can provide. And the third one is the, the degree of, 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 of that direction, the depth of that, that function. I'm going to unpack these for you over the coming slides. So don't worry if, if, if you are scratching your, your head, either physically or, or symbolically. Um, first one, emotional achievement, affective achievement. This is not a term that we came up with. This is coined by the brilliant psychologist Daniel Stern, who studied mother-infant interactions for um, most, if not all, of his career. And he coined a few really interesting ideas in his research looking at nonverbal communication between care providers and, and infants. And one of the concepts he coined and, and studied was effect achievement, which in, in, in his framework means the nonverbal instinctive often achievement that mothers and fathers provide to um, infants and children that do not speak yet. Um, he coined, for example, the term motherese, so not Chinese, but motherese. Wherever you look, any culture, any country, mothers and fathers start to exaggerate their intonations more when they meet an infant or a younger child. Why? Because we instinctively know that this little human being may not speak verbal language yet, but is innately hardwired to respond to melodies and tone colors in a particular way. Um, we are born literally in a musical world. We are, when we are born into this world, literally thrown into this sea of sound waves and we are trying to make sense of that and we are hardwired already at birth innately to respond to certain um, sonic properties and to learn very quickly what tone colors are for example what tone colors are linked to the voice of my mother or my father or that person um, babies are per definition musical creatures which is very interesting. Um, so one of the theories I've been developing is that in a psychedelic state, for reasons we can speculate on and go into, we become a bit, little bit more nonverbal in the way we um, communicate and perceive the world. And we become more sensitive to those elements of nonverbal communication, like musicality, like the musical feature, features in the way we communicate, but also music in itself. Um, so effect achievement, I'm going to pause myself for a moment, pull myself back to this slide. Emotional achievement in our context, using music or psychedelic therapy, means can we attune the music to such a degree that the subjective experience conveyed by the music, communicated by the music, really acknowledging that music is a language, but a nonverbal language, that that mirrors or matches the internal states and the needs of the listener. That's one. Um, the image on the right end is an example of how we're doing it in our software. I made a little print screen where you can, as a therapist, relatively easily switch the different atmospheres, we call them. And these atmospheres are characterized by different emotional qualities. Um, the other one, this one needs a bit of unpacking as well, types of direction. First of all, whenever a therapist talks about psychedelic therapy being non-directive, I, 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 I gently uh, disagree. The very fact that we give patients a medicine that makes them more open, uh, vulnerable, suggestive, one might even argue, and then invite them to listen to emotionally evocative music with their eyes closed and with a headphone, that is providing quite some influence in the experience itself, providing quite some direction in the experience itself. For me, the... Um, conversation is not, the meaning of conversation is not, is psychedelic therapy directive or not? Um, I think various forms of directive therapy are very important. In fact, I think some patients need more directive therapy these days, but that's a whole um, conversation in itself. But can we take more responsibility for the kind of influence that we provide as a therapist in each moment? Can we acknowledge that whatever we do, whether we play music or not, as a therapist, always provides some form of direction, either by a posture, by the tone, the tone of our voice, 
um, the, 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 the choices of our words, right? they're all influencing and providing direction within the experience in, some, in one way or another. The more meaningful question we believe is what kinds of direction do we provide? Which types of direction are most supportive for this person? How can we provide direction in a person-centered way that is really respecting the agency and the needs of this particular individual? So we came up with, um, so we analyzed uh, lots of music and the experience of music, and we came up with three different categories of uh, types of direction. We can also refer to these as functions, different therapeutic functions of music. And the first one we call the soothing uh, um, function. The, um, the, the music here is purely concerned with promoting safety, calm, and reassurance. The focus of this music is, is purely on positive internal resources. It's free of tension, it's free of conflict. Deepening music is per definition intensifying subjective experiences. It promotes the surfacing of feeling states, of emotions, um, and it focuses on both positive and negative valence emotions, harmonious or conflictual internal resources. But, it, it's, but it's intensifying feelings, as it's bringing feeling states more to the surface, more to the expression. Soothe and deepen are in that sense antagonistic. They're literally doing the opposite. The third one, which I sometimes group into deepening, but it's, it's one to mention in itself as well as the releasing function is music that has not only tension, but it actually builds up tension significantly, often providing a release of that particular emotion, a, a strong emotional expression of that emotion. It provides movements and release of emotions. So this is a framework we often provide to therapists when we give workshops on the person-centered use of music. And then there's various ways that we can explore this together. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. The third element that I mentioned is the degree of direction. So this, this, this is where things get interesting. Um, first of all, we talk about emotional achievement. Then we talk about the, we talked about the acknowledging the type of direction, the type of influence, the type of function that we want the music to fulfill. The third element here, which is fully related, is if we, if we acknowledge that we provide an influence in the experience, if we acknowledge that we provide a direction in the experience of the patient, the next question is, what's the degree of that direction? What's the depth of that influence? What's the degree of engagement the music requires or demands? One really simple example to make this come more alive to you is ambient music. Real ambient music is designed to be like an ambient light in a room. You don't, you don't stare at it, but it's a sonic texture that is there. You can listen to it and it's beautiful. And you, in Brian Eno's words, words, ambient music is as ignorable as it is interesting. So this music would be very low in its depth of direction, very low in its degree of engagement. It doesn't demand the attention of the listener. And the other spectrum, when we listen to Wagner, for example, other very narrative, bombastic, intense classical music compositions, and you turn it on a loud volume, it's hard. For me, it's impossible to have a conversation with someone in that context, because the music is really, is really demanding attention. It's really demanding a, a strong engagement um, by the listener. So that spectrum is something to keep in mind as well. And the way we work with that in our, in our, in our instrument is, and I brought these things together here, this, this slide, this image, is we have this, this, um, this wheel where we have different emotional atmospheres. So you can select um, an atmosphere, an emotion. You can facilitate effect achievement in that way. And then you can select the depth of engagement in the music with a one simple bar, um, with the lowest three being very low um, uh, in, its, in its depth and fulfilling primarily the, the soothe function that I just described. And the higher we go, the more demanding and the more um, deepening and the more releasing the music becomes. Um, I think I'm gonna end here um, so we can have enough time for conversation. Yeah, let's do that. 
Thank you all so much. There's, I know there's a lot to process. Um, I, I was limiting myself here and there to not go into too much detail, but I'm really looking forward to enter the conversation with all of you and we can explore some of these things that you are interested in in, in more detail. Mendel, do you want to talk to people first or should we keep a short, like, should we start with the anonymous questions? Um, what do you feel like? Whatever you want, really, I'm open. <laughs> I think I would uh, like to get some of the people in first because now the experience is still in, in, the, in the soul. Um, and I think an interaction would be great at this moment. And I'm just gonna go from like, essentially from most, uh, most salient, uh, we're gonna start with uh, Toby. And if Toby is back with us, um unmute yourself and ask yeah him. i'm back um i was actually a bit disappointed when it ended because i was just kind of starting to relax into it and lose the sense of time and i would have wished that it would have been longer but um overall it was great yeah i felt quite um torn as well that i needed to end it so so soon i agree we yeah. did you include now something you didn't include some tense tension building up and then release thing right okay. Maybe a little bit yeah so what i what i did as a taster was give you two different atmospheres we refer to them one was more emotionally moving um the other one was more is more designed for more meditative like environments um, the one that was more emotionally moving, we had at some point some cello orchestra coming in. We refer to that as our medium level of intensity. And we have high and we have extreme. Uh, in numbers, we have 12 different levels and you listened up to number five. Yeah, we, we have music in the pipeline that is very, very intense. Yeah. I would love to hear that at some point. <laughs> For therapists to really have that spectrum available, like whatever subjective experience is being worked with, um, to work with that. Yeah. Artists that are contributing to that are, um, just to give them credit as well, uh, Greg Haynes, John Hopkins, um, Abel Mogart, Andrea Belfi, <clears throat> who actually works and lives in Berlin, um, Robert Rich. And there's a number of more musicians that you heard in the session, including Superposition, Andrea Drury, Hayden Thorpe, um, Greg Haynes as well, John Hopkins as well, Echt, Dutch artist, uh, Robert Thomas. So we basically have a complex mixing system where artists deliver not tracks, but little building blocks, phrases, melody lines, and we are able to layer them in different ways and thereby create these um, compositional progressions yeah, and levels of complexity that we have control over. Okay, so the music isn't actually AI generated, but made of human people and then kind of mixed together. Okay, okay. Exactly, yeah. It's generative in a sense that it's all blended and mixed live in this moment. And we have also a remix engine, so we can control um, with an equalizer of the frequencies, we can add reverb, we can filter, we can do all sorts of things. But the, the, the original materials are all human created artworks, basically. Um, this is one of the things we really want, we really strive for is for everything to sound very organic rather than computer generated. Yeah. It's still in beta, I'm perfectionist. I'm constantly hearing things that I want to have different, <laughs> but it's moving in the right direction. And I'm really proud of what the team has been built um, over, the, over the last year. It's hard to make generative music sound good. And um, we hear of a system that is just profoundly flexible. Uh, therapists can really do a lot of different things with it. So, uh, Toby, do you feel like your question uh, was answered? Is that, uh, are yeah. you yeah. satisfied? Yeah, I mean, okay, I perfect. didn't have really a question, but yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you want to ask it? That's okay. No, I, do, do you mean the question in the Q&A thing or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, I can ask it. It was like, um, did, you, did you also consider like asking the patients to kind of pre-select some 
soundtracks that they uh, kind of prefer or find meaningful in their mm -hmm. um, great question yeah so there's a few I think attitudes from us ways of working with therapists let me put it that way uh, at the very essence we are developing this as a tool that therapists and other care providers can work with in any way they want you could buy a guitar in a guitar shop and you can play the guitar in any way you want. <laughs> um, that's the level of freedom we are implementing in this instrument. Uh, and that's, we really wanted to, for the reason to be inclusive for any care profession that is concerned and interested in providing a bit more thought and being a bit more thoughtful about the design of their acoustic musical environments. Having said that, we have developed and are developing protocols and um, workshops for therapists as well. One of the things we have developed is um, a way of working with patient selected music, uh, self-selected music. Um, this is a really interesting, it's a very large topic, um, but it's an interesting one because needless to say patients will ask this a lot. Um, at least a significant portion of patients will ask, hey, can I bring in some of my favorite songs or could I have a say about what music is being played? The way you approach that conversation as a therapist is very important and quite delicate. Um, you don't want to enter a situation where that degree of freedom, even if it's little, could be used as a way to control the experience or resist the experience or, 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 um, or um, prevent um, the, the patient to really engage therapeutically with the experience. You want to, we, want, we don't want this to be, uh, we don't want patients to become DJs for hours during the session. Um, uh, we want them to go inside of themselves and, and, and go on this therapeutic journey as a therapist. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no role for self-selected music. It's just the way how it's phrased, the language around it, the boundaries around it, and all those things. And th these are the things that we are, with some sites in Europe and the US are, are working with. We have a little protocol for self-selected music and, and how therapists can, can work with that. And it can be really therapeutic to, to bring that in. Um, um, one group you're working with is an MDMA for PTSD, uh, site um, and it, it, the feedback we're getting is that this is really helping with the therapeutic alliance with the sense of agency that, that especially that patient population feels over the the session which um, for for many it's of course quite an ask to give control away to in this case a therapist over the music so having some input and having that input being acknowledged is, is quite powerful um, another thing which um, we are developing is um, first of all, we look not only at the acute experience, we look at the period before the psychedelic session, the preparation phase, we call it internally, the acute phase, the acute experience, and then the, the integration phase afterwards and how music can be used for all of that. In the preparation phase, we are encouraging patients to listen to music at home. And we have a framework around that, a deep listening framework. For many people, it's already quite something to lie which with an eye mask can go inside. It can even be quite frightening for some people. And doing that together with a therapist and then practicing that at home can really um, give some powerful tools before the session itself begins. I sometimes really believe that preparation is 50, if not 75% of the session is determined by everything that happens before between therapist and, and client. Um, in, our, in our system, we also are working on a way that, that, that our system is then learning what is patient is and with who I mean what musical compositional acoustic variables are closest to the musical language that this person has developed so that when the, when the system is singing to the patient it's singing in an even more of a personalized way it's really understanding what instruments what, what tone colors what compositional qualities are most likely to be supportive for in for this individual so it's really a win-win. We, we help patients to, 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 to feel more ready to go inward and to, to shift the, atten the, the attitude towards the experience away from wanting to control things and away from liking or disliking the music and really focus on the experience and, and engaging with one's imagination, for example, and how that imagination is unfolding with the music and really helping people to do that before the session begins is proving to be quite effective. Yeah. So there's different ways we, we are kind of, kind of encourage people to listen together with patients before the session. 
And it's, as a therapist, it's, it's fantastic to do that in preparation sessions, to listen to music together. It's a very simple and fun way to build that, to strengthen that, that alliance. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, just a quick thing. In case the meeting closes after 8 p.m., we're going to set it up again and we're going to keep on talking here, just so you know, but we don't expect it to. But if, if that would happen, um, just come back. We have the same link. Um, okay, that's just technicality. And I would love to then move on to, actually, I think we can, we can answer two questions at once. And it's, it's Gregor's question and also Sam's uh, second question. It's about stereo and headphones and the entire um, yeah, technology around it. Gregor, take it away. Uh, may I specify a little bit about the question? My, so first, super impressive tool. So it's super excited to see uh, that something like this is put together. It's quite something. I was wondering, uh, since this wave path is stereo, if you consider to include spatial audio, mm -hmm. like informed by the tradition of Shippo shamans who the way they deliver the Ikaro, they also vary the distance and uh, or a source where they, where they sing from. And to my personal experience, it seems to be very uh, effective to create a more immersive experience. Yeah, uh, short answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> the more uh, in-depth answer is we started that way. Um, I was just having this conversation with Max, Alessandro and Alejandra before this meeting began. And I was sharing with them that there is this paradox that we all are encouraged to work more virtual these days. And there's some real benefits to it. But I really believe that the world is too virtual. And some of you may know that we started with physical spaces in London. We had a physical location in London before we focused on software development with the intention to have a permanent location to really double down on things like 3D sound technologies and how they can be used in um, therapeutic practices of all sorts. So in that space, we had 21 speakers for one person. And it was a beautiful space. Um, and yeah, we, we did research there. We, we, we first of all showed that we can, not with music, but comparing that with all that's happened, the degree that people feel that, yeah, they're, they're, they feel disembodied. They're literally on this journey. Um, and also that those peak experiences correlate with improvements in well being afterwards. So I think when we are interested in using music as a psychedelic, which we are really deeply interested in, the, the quality of the music, the sound, and the way that sound is delivered and offered, and the whole framework around it, really, the whole ritual around it is, is, is essential. Uh, and that's, that's definitely one of the things we can learn from, from many things from traditional use of psychedelics is, is the ritual and the, the deep engagement with the music in, in the moment. Yeah. Maybe just a side note, so it's possible to create this 3D or 4D sound also with two speakers, it's headphones to create this immersive yeah, we do. sound. Yeah. Yeah. There, are, there are ways to do that. Yeah. We're looking into that. It's just simply at this moment, not the highest priority for us when we are building this platform. Um, we can create beautiful immersive experiences with good stereo headphones, but yeah, we, we are very aware of, of the possibilities on, on that front. Yeah. Is this something you're working in yourself as well? Um, not precisely, but uh, I'm super curious to uh, yeah. follow the development. And uh, I would be super uh, happy if you could send a link also to uh, try out a little bit more this platform. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I, think I, can, um, I can send instructions for that to um, Alessandro and he can and pass it on to all the attendees for sure. Great. So um, I think that that Sam should actually uh, like ask a f like the follow up question to this because it's about um, not only going beyond stereo, but also going beyond audible frequencies. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm personally re really interested uh, in that too. Um, so Sam. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I was just saying uh, you kind of actually answered it already, but. Um, the thought is that sound and music is something that we experience um, it also in a non-cochlear way or ex we experience it bodily um, in, in terms of like um, like we hear through our skin and we also hear feel vibration through our bones and all of this sort of stuff. So I had I had wondered and um, 
I'd wondered if you'd considered that sort of stuff, but I think you already answered that question. Yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons why wave paths exist is to really double down on, on, on answering these questions. Um, if you look in the literature and you are interested in, let's say, binaural beats or hemispheric synchronization or all those things, um, I haven't found, and I would love people to show me a single study that proves this is more than a placebo effect. Um, some of these studies, um, well, mm -hmm. the, the ones that are published. But I think that my intuition is that there are things in sound and music that we simply haven't studied yet, and we simply have, haven't put enough effort in to understand um, the effects of maybe even inaudible frequencies on our um, our body and our, our consciousness. I mean, there is a whole field of study um, by, the, by the secret intelligence services of the United States that look deeply into how sound can be weaponized. There's actually a really interesting book written about this. I will look up the author and, and see if I can share this later as well. But um, weapons, yeah. sound can destroy, sound waves can, can literally destroy buildings and, and impact the body in really negative ways as well. Uh, and there are weapons being developed that are purely sonic. Um, in fact, some um, anti-demonstration um, police um, forces are using them as a demonstrator so they get nauseous or dizzy. Or, um, mm. These are sound weapons that are being developed. Um, I'm convinced that that same can be used for, for improvements in well-being. Uh, this is something we are, we are looking at. Mm. Uh, the reason why we focus on music and not on sound is because that's where the most richest psychotherapeutically, psychodynamically um, meaningful experiences seem to happen. And this is not the only thing we're interested in, but this is one of the things we, are, we started with, basically, is the, um, the way music seemed to be able to really carry you on this journey of self-discovery and how the imagery and all the experience that is unfolding with it is really a, a projection of your own mind. And if, if you're really um, study for some of the more introspective music therapy traditions out there, like the Bunny Method, which, by the way, came forth directly from psychedelic therapy research in the 60s, um, it's very clear that music is this amazing tool that therapists, even without drugs, can use to, to um, activate subconscious materials and, 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 and bring them into the analysis. That actually kind of, I, I hope you don't mind if I'm talking too much, but that just sort, sort of leads no. into it. Like I had asked another question and it's actually the next one on the list anyway. <laughs> so, um, which is just about um, the selection of musical attributes that you've made um, and really about the idea of um, uh, sounds that are sort of traditionally coded as musical. So like musical instruments or the singing voice are used, but um, things like environmental sound, mm -hmm. um, uh, ambient sound uh, that are not necessarily traditionally read as music, but still can have this, the exact same kinds of powerful um, mm -hmm. experiences. So if, if you use that kind of stuff, how you factor it in and how you fit that into your whole, um, this taxonomy you've got of like, you know, bright yeah. and uplifting and this yeah. and that. Yeah. Um, so we, 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 we are doing that. We are working with field recordists at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the way it's going to be implemented in a system is not completely clear yet, but most likely it can be as simple as an extra volume button that is purely for various field recordings. And then you having selection over a wide range of different sounds you can add to that mix if you want that as a therapist. Yeah. And again, I, I'm constantly saying what the therapist wants, but we are really, our, our core objective here is to make person-centered use of music really simple and intuitive. And the degree of influence that you as a therapist may want to have over the music is completely up to you. You can select the variables and, and trust the system and let it, let it do its own thing and simply change it at moments if you want it to change. And you can facilitate those changes really simply. Um, or you can be more active, um, actively engage with it as you play an amusement instrument, basically. Um, and, 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 and what happens in those variables is more and more informed by predictive models we are, we are building. Um, what, what medicine is being used, what variables in this individual will be useful for us to assess what music will be most supportive during the session, um, what are the pharmacodynamics of, the, of, of the, the drug experience, what themes does this person bring in the therapy session, how can they be reflected most likely through the music for this person, and there's a whole repertoire of, uh, of stuff that we are exploring at this moment, which is 
very excited, um, exciting. I'm really, really exciting about, excited about this. Um, the, the question how universal these things are is, is interesting. Um, I really think what we will most likely find, what we are actually already finding is clusters of what music people have been exposed to through upbringing to their cultures as being the, the strongest predictor for what, um, what resonates with them. But then there are certain elements in sounds that are more, also to one point in my talk, more innate, more evolutionary ancient. Uh, and there are some studies that also demonstrate that. Um, you look at tone color, for example, and the degree of dissonance, the amount of dissonance in tone color, this is universally perceived as negative valence, which is interesting. Yeah, as threatening or, or angry or, or you name it. Um, increase in tempo are, are also, you know, at least in those tribes that are, of course, studied, <laughs> perceived as um, threatening or, or da dangerous. Um, there's a few things that seem to be linked with um, a very ancient evolutionary um, ways of processing sound. And I mean, we can define music in various different ways, but I often like to view music as an invention that hacks our innate sensitivities to sound in various ways and is able to build these, these very intricate experiences out of it. Um, but mu music is really, in that sense, a technology. Um, of course, there's musicality in nature um, that you can perceive and, and, and enjoy. But um, instrumental music of all sorts is a very interesting innovation that we have created. I am a field recordist, by the way. For, for 15 years, I've been recording sounds um, all the way from rainforest to um, um, drone sounds of the local van or freezer or car park or <laughs> you name it. Yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Um, all right, so the next question is I think mine. So I'm gonna ask it myself. Um, so I was wondering about uh, how you want to, yeah, incorporate feedback from the patient and from prior um, studies or prior sessions into um, what the AI is generating for the next session maybe, or even within the session. So I'm thinking about um, direct physiological recordings from the patient, like heart rate or even uh, deeper stuff that's coming from the cortex, like EEG, and also, um, or body temperature, noises that the patient makes, um, mm. or just plain movement. And if that is something that you yeah. uh, are trying to incorporate. Yeah, all of that. <laughs> Body posture, um, vocal um, effect coding, like what what emotions might be decoded from the from vocal expressions, um, independently from the verbal content itself. Um, body movement, heart rate variability, breathing. We're really interested in breathing. Um, and this is a really interesting um, topic because we don't have the intention to build a machine that makes all sorts of decisions for you or for your for the therapist or for the patient. We really like to create um, a collaborative environment between patient, therapist, and in this case, the machine, where there is a constant feedback loop between all these different um, agents. And at this moment, we are primarily using manual input by the therapist that will change the music. The therapist in conversation with the client, really with our core intention, not only to make person-centered use of music more intuitive and easy and all of that for therapists, but also really to create an instrument here that is not only making that more easy, but also really, or let me put it differently, not only um, preventing the, the therapist to be distracted from the patient, but that's, that's number one, we don't want therapists to suddenly be lost in trying to find a new song in their Spotify list or iTunes or whatever and being completely in a different state of cognition away from the patient, really breaking that empathic resonance. That's what we want to prevent, but we like to go further than that and really ask ourselves, can we create something that is actually part of the intuitive process of the therapist? Can this be an extension of how therapists work as artists, really acknowledging that there's an artistic intuition that we want to implicitly support with our systems. Um, 
no, it may, it may take us years to really get there, but that's the, that's the ambition. <laughs> um, and it's one step at a time here. So when you ask this question about biometrics, this is another thing we are sequencing. We're currently studying um, really, really interesting, but, but, but also basic foundations of how uh, heart rate variability, breathing, body posture, and EEG correlates over an entire psychedelic therapy session, for example. We primarily work with ketamine, but a few other partners that we work with uh, for psilocybin and, and DMT. Um, and then can we decode some, um, some, some meaningful information about how supportive this music is or not? And, can that, and, and if the music is not supportive, what um, support can we provide for the therapist to actually change the music um, in, in an intuitive and an effective way? Because changing the music is a whole theme in itself. You may not always need or want to change the music, right? Sometimes experiences, for example, can be challenging therapeutically. Um, and the intervention is more in the uh, interpersonal um, domain. And you may actually want to find a way to explore the content of the experience in more depth. And changing the music may, may prevent that therapeutic opportunity. But yeah, long, to kind of go back to your main question about biometrics, we are exploring that. And uh, especially this quarter, actually, we have um, a new two new scientists that, that, that join the team. And it's something that we are continuously doubling down on over the coming period. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and what I realize in my question, that there is this intrinsic problem of what to label as beneficial when. Um, so mm -hmm. you really don't know how to train the AI to be able to say, okay, this is something that should, we should push for physiologically, and this is something that we should restrain from. So, so this is the, the therapist's role um, and yeah, intuition of the therapist. Yeah, I think there, there are certain things that AI is really good at and really yeah. bad at. And there are certain things we don't want AI to do, or at least I would argue we don't want AI to do. Um, what we don't want AI to do is remove human beings from the picture, for example. That's something that I'm vocally against that. Um, and we're laughing, but actually there's, there are movements in this field that would argue that it will be helpful because it will make psychedelic therapy cheaper, which is true, of course. Um, but I'm, co I'm coming more from a psychotherapeutically informed perspective where I recognize that the relationship is where a lot of the healing happens. And we need to be really careful of fetishizing music or technology uh, in, in, in various ways. And we view all these as, as tools that can be used in, the, uh, in certain ways. Um, and they can also be damaged if they're not damaging, if they're not used in, 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 in certain ways. Um, what AI is really good at is crazy computational capacities to build predictions about what other music patient A would most likely resonate with if this music is resonating, right? And then another part of that model is nested kind of conditional on the experience that this patient is having or the drug that this patient is having. So that kind of stuff we're, we're confident in that we get quite good at. Um, but um, really deciding what the patients should listen, we also don't want AI to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, but again, um, we, we, we allow optimization to happen if therapists want that, right? So if, if there's certain variables that you fill in and, and you have this dynamic, flexible musical environment that does things well, um, you should totally let it do its thing. But we, we always want to make sure that there is um, an element of co-creation that is, that is present between therapist, patient and, and machine. We do it in various ways. We're currently exploring, for example, um, vocal interaction. So can the system actually respond to voice uh, singing? And can the singing, the human singing and the system together create a composition basically that is unfolding over the minutes afterwards? Um, these kind of interactive elements we are we are really interested in to explore more and more in the coming, the coming months. Beautiful. Um we might get the award for best natural segues uh, in regards to the question because what you were just talking about is the the highest voted question is um and, and it's anonymous it says have you encountered resistance to the ai generated nature of this music that it lacks humanity or soul how do you work to give it a human touch mm -hmm. i think part of that you've so, already answered um but uh, i think just to to yeah. crystallize that once more 
I'm, I'm sometimes thinking that we maybe should just scrap the word AI uh, completely. Right now, we don't really have an AI to begin with. We simply have a set of, of smart regression models, and that's it. Um, is it AI? I mean, that's a whole conversation. I don't think so. Um, I, um, we focus on adaptive music as a term more and more for that reason. You build adaptive music tools for therapists. Um, but there's still a wider kind of question there, and that is what's the transference, right? When it comes to AI and technology for the patient, for the therapist, how does it impact the, um, the, the session? Um, we don't want to um, necessarily, like some people would do, anthropomorphize the technology itself or give it human qualities or, or lifelike qualities. We really want to view it as a tool um, that you can engage with. Um, what we um, what we do in terms of music is um, working with musicians, and this is another reason why sometimes I'm pushing back to this idea of AI generated music because it's not. At least for us, it's not. It's 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 built by talented musicians, and we simply create an environment where all of those molecules can evolve together but the molecules are human created the molecules here being various musical source various various source materials various musical source materials um, and that is expanding and that is actually and that is expanding automatically um soon as well because the, the the musical source materials are interacting with each other and create new materials within the system so it's really becoming this evolving musical world at the moment which is really exciting um, but it's all human materials. Well, well, it's human created materials. Some humans, of course, work with, some human artists work with, with, with synths and, and you name it. Um, we are interested in maybe training, let's say neural nets on some music in order to provide timbre transfer and see how we can modulate the timbre in, in tone color in, in interesting ways. Uh, so we def there will be definitely those kind of AI components that you're working with um, as well. We did some experiments on that front and it all sounds really crap. So we decided not to, <laughs> not to continue yeah, for the time being. All right. Um, so we want to keep uh, like the, this, this short now. So I think we should um, maybe do a, a, a somewhat of a more quicker touch. And I actually found a way to, to like uh, put together or sum up uh, some of the questions because one that is also very, uh, shows a lot of interest by, by people here is, um, and there's another question that, that fits into that or is the same question as just from the other side. There's a question about the continuity of the experience. So that there is no break between these, um, these different modes that you have shown um, and then there is a question about what about the role of silence in uh, psychedelic therapy, which in a sense is, is somewhat the same question. Um, so what's your take on that? So the first element of the question is more a question about the, the flow of the experience, yes. the, um, the way the experience um, evolves over time. And the, the second is more concretely about silence itself. Uh, I believe it was Toby who mentioned this um, right after the listening experience that it felt at the moment that you were sinking in, the music was suddenly ending. Right? And that is, that is an example of the experience being disrupted. Right? No matter if the, in this case, even if the music was fading out a little bit. Um, in therapy, you wanna be very careful with disrupting the experience. Um, um, I mean, sometimes you want to disrupt the experience if you as a therapist make, think it's good to, to change it with, 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 with some forcefulness um, if people enter acute psychotic states or anxiety or whatever um, there is a question mark about what the right time is to relate to that and 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 and, and, and see if you can change it in, in, in different ways for example um, we believe it's very important to have a sense of continuity in the musical experience um, really to respect the unfolding internal narrative journey if you wish over that stretch of time and our, that's one of the things therapists say about our system that they like is with spotify or whatever you need to stop the music and you have these really abrupt changes and also songs have limited um uh, the boundaries around their time they, they have a beginning and an ending whereas here you can really post kind of stretch things out as, as long as you want basically or 
or modulated in, in various other ways. Now, the smoothness and the continuity of the experience, the flow is something I was already quite obsessed with when I was designing the psilocybin playlist for Imperial. And there I went into great detail in thinking through the, 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 the shape of the volume fade-ins, um, the, the way a song, the songs in this case work with songs were um, blending with each other, sometimes literally blending with a subtle remix or sometimes by having a little pause in between your songs and kind of working with the, the, the breath or the, the, the pulse of the, 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 in the previous song and then finding a way for that other song to start um, at the right time to really create a sense of continuity. Um, um, so yeah, it's important in order to support that, that immersive journey and respect it. Uh, there's, a, there's a vulnerability that people um, are invited to, to, to display. Um, and when there are ab abrupt changes, it implicitly signals um, that the environment may not be as safe as one may uh, um, think, for example. Right? If there's a sudden glitch in the music or the music is suddenly paused or an experience is suddenly um, disrupted, those are really basic things you want to prevent at all costs as a therapist. Um, but yeah, I, I, the, the second part of the question is very related because I, 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 I immediately wanted to say that, um, even if it wasn't asked, that we should never jump to the conclusion that because music is such a powerful, impactful therapeutic tool that per definition, we should fill sessions with music entirely. I really think that that, that is a dangerous um, idea um, for, for various reasons. Um, at the very first, silence itself um, really is, has ther a therapeutic potential. Um, ther therapists call about the uh, talk about the potential space that sciences allow, for example. I think it was Winnicott who coined that term. Um, then you have Buddhist traditions, of course, that are built around this concept of um, the science not being just science, but actually being um, shunyata, which means um, a void that is not necessarily an empty void, but a void that is filled with potential, uh, filled with nutrition in a way. Um, now, those kind of um, experiences can be really powerful in, in, in psychedelic therapy, but as a therapist, you want to brief patients on that. This was a mistake I made in the psilocybin playlist at Imperial. I built in blocks of silence, but I didn't, we didn't, but the therapist talk about actually explaining to patients that there would be moments of silence. They were in this huge flow with the music and suddenly, well, not suddenly, but the music faded out and it was this silence of 15 minutes and everyone thought that there was a mistake with the music system, right? So that is, that's a classic thing you want to prevent at all costs. And it really, again, illustrates the importance of handholding uh, and, and, and preparing people um, as much as possible before the session. So silence, uh, I believe, um, this is very philosophical, of course, but, but has a potential uh, in therapy to be really therapeutic. Um, and the other uh, element to my answer to that, that point would be that music, per definition, moves the experience. Music, per definition, influences the experience. Music, per definition, is there to change the experience. And this is what I mean with not agreeing that psychedelic therapy is non-directive. It's directive by the very fact that we play music to people. Um, the question is more, what's the degree of the influence of the music and how can we control that and what kind of influence? So that's the question as well. Do we need to move the experience? Do we need to provide some movement or change right now with music? And if so, what? And it's, it's not always needed. And sometimes the best gift to a patient would actually be a, a moment of silence. Um, to not have the subjective experience constantly being influenced and molded. Um, there's an, yeah, let's good. see if there's another element there. There's a, this is the final point actually. There's another thing that is, that has to do with saturation of, of, of the perception of music. If, if you have blocks of silence, what we found is that music is really ex experienced more freshly. It's almost as if the ears open up more after that moment of silence for that music and then, then begins again. And there's a new salience that has emerged for the music as well that, that, you, that you can utilize. So, so silence can be utilized in different ways here therapeutically. I, I have a short follow-up question on that, a very practical one. Uh, what do you think um, 
in a in a psilocybin session. This is a very practical question because we're we're just designing the, the music, our music playlist. Mm -hmm. um, when do you think is a good time for breaks? Is it uh, is it uh, more in the um, in the uh, after the peak or already before it? Um, or is it after especially emotional songs? Or uh, mm -hmm. do you have any, any hints in that direction? I would break, you mean the moment of silence, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's not a light that goes on with a, with a bell that says, this is the break, and here are the advertisements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, no, sure, but without kidding, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I mean, maybe you hate me for this question, for this answer, but I would say there's no protocol for that. It really depends on the, on the experience that the patient has. Um, in playlists that I created for Imperial, that is a fixed playlist um, without any adaptation, Silence was there approximately every 45 minutes to an hour. Um, at these longer, longer periods of silence and these periods were between two minutes and 15 minutes. And then sometimes, and I, I, I often, this is what I still would, would suggest to, to therapists like yourself is to think in blocks. And I think you already are doing this with these building, these really being building blocks for a playlist, let's say. And these building blocks maybe being on average 20 to 30 minutes long so you have some pivoting capacity after each uh, block. And that, 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 that also means that every 20 to 30 minutes, you will have that break automatically, right? And then you can decide to, that if you want this break to be two seconds or two minutes or, or longer or shorter. Yeah. But I would say in general, as a rule of thumb, I would encourage to have some moments of silence after very emotionally evocative um, pieces. But again, it really depends on the process of the patient. It may very well be that the patient needs some more um, care, some more holding, some more structure. And music is a very powerful way to do that non-verbally, to provide that safe bedding in which you can land after um, a strong cathartic experience. Um, yeah. It sounds to me that you're intuitively already thinking really in the right, in, in the right ways. Yeah, I like, I like the fact that we're working with blocks rather than fixed playlists, first of all. Congratulations. I mean, that's a massive, uh, massive um, development. Yeah. yeah it, it's also for the therapist, so that they don't get too bored from the same uh, playlist after 100 patients. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, true, true. All right, perfect. So um, maybe just to close this off, there were some questions about... Um, what to do next. And there was some awe, I think, created uh, by your system today. Um, mm -hmm. And there is the, the ask of how to interact with, with wave paths uh, apart from this uh, session today. Um, so I want to give you a chance to essentially pitch the wave paths human API and uh, how to get in, <laughs> in, 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 in contact with, with wave paths and how to stay in contact uh, with especially the musical output that you're creating here? Mm -hmm. So we are currently deep in beta testing mode. Um, we don't have this system available publicly yet, but we are expecting this to be released publicly at the end of this quarter, so the end of June. Um, we have a good number of beta testers at the moment, about 140 clinics and therapists. Um, I'm more than ha happy to bump any of you up the wait list and, and make sure that you're part of this beta testing program, which is starting. And we, how we do this is by onboarding events. So these onboarding events are moments where we are inviting all the new curious therapists to a shared uh, video session where not only me, but many of my colleagues will explain the system, sharing the screen. And only after that are we granting access to the tool itself. And we really want to do that to make sure that people have enough of an understanding of the tool before they are working with it. So if any of you is interested in the next um, introduction event, I think we have one in a week. And it will be rather simple to add your name and email address to that list. The introduction event lasts, I believe, for an hour max. And... Um, and it means that you have access to our community platform as well, which is a private, so a private social media platform dedicated to the use of music and psychic therapy. And you can engage with other therapists uh, there around your experience with music. We're developing various virtual courses on there as well. 
Um, yeah, that, 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 that's totally possible. And if you want to stay involved in it, just update it in a different way, you can go to our website, sign up to our newsletter. We are on Facebook, I believe, Twitter and Instagram as well. So that's, uh, these are the obvious ones. And just from personal experience, I've also signed up. I'm not a therapist myself. Um, and there is mm -hmm. just the beautiful website, which I can just say that just visually, I know it's not the product, mm -hmm. but congratulations on that. That's just gorgeous. And it's something that's really nice to play, even without having an interface uh, to play as ambience uh, for studying, for reading, for lying down. It's, it's really beautiful. So make an account at wavepaths.com is the website. And um, I mean, I'm using that regularly. It's really I'm fun. I'm surprised yeah. how many people are using that, actually. Mm -hmm. that we have thousands of frequent users of, of just the, 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 the simple tool we created for the website, which, by the way, includes a lot of new music that we created for psychotherapy, not everything. And if, we, if, if I was describing this, this bar, this depth of engagement bar that we give therapists control over with the 12 different levels, and you heard today those two different waves of music going from one to five, on the website, you hear one, two, three, two, one, two, three, on repeat. Mm. And it's, and then it's config, con, con, configuring itself for different musical constellations all the time. Yeah. Perfect. And also one thing that people might be wondering, uh, one thing that is really cool is that you can even open this in on your browser, on your phone and lock the phone and it doesn't stop playing, which is amazing. Okay. Um, <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's just... Yeah. Great, yeah. Um, so cool. Uh, is there anything you wanna uh, you wanna say? Um, I mean, there's so much to say. I'm, I don't have my sli the Slido window here in front of me, but I really enjoyed the questions. Um, as you noticed, um, I don't have answers to all the questions. Uh, we are actively exploring some of these questions right now with our research, and some of them in the near future. Um, the questions around frequencies, for example, I get a lot. And this is an example of something that we are you know, gradually looking into as well. The biometric um, integration element is one that we are actively working on right now. Um, we are committed to publish our results open source in academic journals as we progress, which is really part of our intention to keep contributing to the, the knowledge that we are creating for, for the psychedelic therapy community. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really... I've been really enjoying the session and I hope it was fun and inspiring. Um, and if any of you would like to stay in touch, yeah, we can do it in the way that I just suggested. I'm happy to take a few more questions or comments, by the way, for five minutes or so. But then afterwards, I will start making my, my dinner. <laughs> Good. Um, I think that I can also offer um, my connection because I have um, been in contact with uh, WavePass and I've uh, also been at one of those onboarding meetings without being a therapist. Um, so if anyone has a question regarding WavePath specifically, you can also take me as the first instance. Um, and if I can't answer that, which will happen, I will, um, yeah, make the contact to, to Mendel um, and his team. This is what I can offer and want to offer specifically. And then just to you directly, Mendel, um, you've in the beginning said that, that uh, you feel happy that we have offered you a two hour slot. And I just wanna give that back to you. You've given us two and a half hours of, of really just super intense and, and, and beautiful work. And it's a great pleasure to, to have done this. I've, I've enjoyed it very much. And I, I think um, I can see in a lot of the faces that this was a good thing. So yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Also thank from you. me, Mendel. It's a real you. pleasure for me as well. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful evening. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for this fascinating experience. You're welcome. It's fun to work with talk. Yeah. Thanks, Alejandro. And thank Thanks. you, Alessandro and Max, for this, for moderating this event. And also, Alessandro and the ad section for organizing this uh, talk experience it was really cool. It was so easy. So, uh, a bliss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right, so um, if everyone is allowed to eat dinner. I wanna, just, this is a very, very spontaneous random thought because some, some of you found the session too short. I'm more than happy to set up a new session that is longer. <laughs> if any of you wants to have a new music experience for the evening, I'm more than happy to set it up. I shared a link and, um, and you can listen. And I, I think I saw someone being an Abu Mogart fan. Is that correct? Yes. That's yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, he's an, an, one of the many amazing artists that I'm super, super 
grateful for to work with because we are really looking to build a new sound here that is not necessarily fixated in one culture or one, one, one place or one time. And Abul is one of those artists that are really pushing the boundaries. I can, I can definitely play some of his music as well. Um, well, should I do that without turning this into another long monologue of mine? Should I just create a session and share it here? Are there people that are going to use that? Yeah. Uh, sorry, could it be without the uh, um, meditation, like uh, narration, please? Like, because I, I would love to listen, but I want to also study. So it would be weird to kind of. <laughs> sure. Uh, but but if everyone else is, is fine with it, I don't want to push the minority. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to create one without a meditation. I'm also more than happy to create two, one with and one without. It may be the best solution here. Yeah. Okay, so in that case, I'm gonna create two links and I will share that here in the chat in about two minutes. Um, can, can I actually ask one quick question? Yes. Uh, I was just wondering for, uh, I am not really an artist myself, but for people who, who make music as well, is there a possibility to be in touch with you if they want to be part of this project? Contribute music. Yeah, because I know a lot of people that m make music in this kind of more ambient space. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they can drop us an email um, at careers at wavepants.com. Okay. Um, at this moment, we, yeah, we are gradually opening up for people that come in through the inbox at this moment, it's very curated, to be honest, and primarily me uh, selecting artists that are, that we want to work with. But I'm always keen to hear more music that is coming in. So please share this with your friends. It would be, it would be a pleasure to have a listen. <laughs>